Hi, and thanks for your time this afternoon. As you know, if you've been at the conference, cool digital stuff is being made around the world all the time by children and youth in and out of school. But some kids and youth, those with special needs, are left out of this making. I'm here as a general ed literacy researcher to talk about a, I don't think that's my next slide. Keep talking. I'm here as a general ed literacy researcher to talk about a gap, it's not, a divide, a disciplinary disinclination. Nope, I'm, these are the end of my slides. Should I just keep talking? This is my last, just keep talking? As, <laughs> okay, I gotta go back, sorry. Special ed researchers are disinclined to see children and youth with disabilities as makers or designers of potentially powerful digital media. They're all out of order. And digital media and learning scholars and practitioners like yourselves are also disinclined to talk about or work with children and youth with special needs. This is a problem of equity and access. Worse, it's a social justice problem. Hi, right, slide number two. Okay. We'll get there. So this can be like a puzzle for you. You can figure out what goes with what I say. Uh, so in the fall of 2012, there are about 67 million students ages 6 to 21 in the U.S. Of those 67 million, 8.5% or 5.5 million students receive special ed services. What do I mean by the label special ed? 40% have a specific learning disability, 18% have a speech or language impairment, 8% have autism, 6.3% are emotionally disturbed, 2% have developmental delays. Oh look, there's my, there's my statistics. There is, of course, technology in the special ed world. The most recognized kind is assistive technology, technological devices that allow learners to communicate. For example, Stephen Hawking has a thumb switch and a blink switch on his glasses that allowed him to go online, send email, and speak through a voice synthesizer. Sorry, someday you'll see a picture of Stephen Hawking soon. The other kind of technology in special ed is instructional software that helps kids learn skills, like technology-based graphic organizers. But using technology, oh, there he is. Using. <laughs> Uh, using technology to make things with kids, making, th making powerful products with kids with special needs, not so much. Meanwhile, in the DML world, there are all sorts of interesting projects going on. We don't yet necessarily know the effects on youth of becoming content producers, but we do know, oh, there's the graphic organizer. We do know that many kids are making cool stuff around the world. Indeed, one of the goals underlying a lot of DML work is to increase equity, access, and social justice. Uh, in projects like one that hey, there's a slide for somewhere, children and youth are crafting identities in digital products, using them to connect with digital audiences. But as I said, these are parallel worlds. There's very little work in the DML field with children and youth with disabilities, and there's very little work in special education that positions children as makers of digital artifacts of any kind. So what are the consequences of these disciplinary disinclinations? Well, 80% of students with disabilities spend 40% of their time in regular classrooms, so some kids with special needs could be included in in-school digital media production. If it's done in school, that is, still not, no. just don't look at the slides. As you know, most of the vast majority of work in school is still non-digital. Then there are the 20% of those students with disabilities who get no general ed exposure and who have no productive technologies in their classrooms. Out of school, there's very little research about special needs kids using technology out of school. Merrill Alper's recent book is one of the very few examples. I know. But this isn't meant to be a dire, depressing Ignite talk, and here's why. I'm going to offer my own work as an example of how to bring these two fields together. I've been making videos on iPads with kids at a public school for four years. My team and I have helped 200 kids ages 8 to 10 design about 350 movies. The statistics are proportional, so about 18 of those 200 kids had disabilities of some sort or another. I didn't know the statistics or the labels at first, but as I began to work with the kids and analyze my data, I saw the special needs kids, and I began to talk to my special ed colleagues about them. There was Cindy, an eight-year-old Latino with autism. So Cindy, there's a picture of her in here somewhere, and she took ballet class, and so she danced in part of her autobiography. You might think making a video with an autistic kid would be difficult, and it was, but actually the autistic, child, autistic child's urge to make things perfect was a strength for her in this process. There was Alex, who had dyslexia, who did all of the writing tasks. We asked him, scripting, storyboarding, while hating it. And then he did it to get to the iPad and get that in his hands. And the moment he had it, he went and made his movies without actually referencing his writing. Oh, there's Cindy, there she is. Uh, and then there was Javier, who had several learning disabilities, including dyslexia, dysgraphia, and issues with fine motor coordination. Ah, oh, there's, there's Alex's writing. Uh, uh, writing in particular was very hard for Javier. He loved to draw those, so he drew many of the images for his movies, including one of his family that passed by some time ago. Uh, three of Javier's movies were solo projects, and two were with groups. His high level, oh, there's the ending slide. Am I timing off too, Claudia? Do I have a minute? Keep going, okay. Three of his movies were solo projects, two were with groups. His level of participation was possible, mostly because we didn't know that he couldn't make movies, so we didn't try to stop him. 
Uh, as I've worked to analyze data, ah, okay, Stephen, come on up. Here you go. 